recording. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's 9, 12 a.m. on uh, Tuesday, November the 14th. Um, this is a meeting of the zoning ordinance advisory committee. Okay. Uh, I'm the chair of the committee, Tipton Housewright. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah for a roll call. Okay. Um, chair Housewright. Present. Present. Uh, Vice Chair Blair. Present. Mr. Berry. And um, Mr. McGregor. Present. And uh, we know that uh, uh, by the regular um, Vice Chair Rubin is absent, so is uh, Mr. Barrett and Mr. Reeves. Um, would you like to um, uh, discuss who the acting Vice Chair would be for the meeting? Um, well, is, is, is it not Commissioner Blair? Oh, yes, it is. I don't know why I was thinking Rubin. Okay. <laughs> He's the other Vice Chair. <laughs> so we do have a quorum. Uh, would you like me to read in um, the item? Uh, What's that? She needs to be in the room. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. just, just a moment. Okay. Yeah, just okay. Uh, let me let me just make a, a couple of remarks about uh, what we're going to do this morning, and then ask Ms. May to read. Um, we will uh, have the item read into the record. We'll have a report presentation from the city attorney's office. Uh, we'll have uh, time for uh, the uh, commission members to ask questions, and then we'll take uh, our speakers, uh, register speakers uh, first, and then those present that have not registered may speak as well. We'll be uh, confining those remarks to two minutes each. Um, and lastly, I would just remind everyone that uh, we do operate under the rules of CPC, which um, does not allow disruptions to the meeting. And if uh, disruptions occur, uh, that person will be uh, put on notice and uh, removed if there's another uh, disruption. So uh, I know that uh, we won't have any issues with that this morning. I appreciate that. So uh, I will turn it back to Ms. May to uh, read our item into the record today. Okay. Uh our first item today is CA 223-008. It's consideration of amending the notice requirements for zoning cases and code amendments that may result in the creation of a non-conforming use and the requirements for initiating and conducting a board of adjustment hearing to establish a compliance date in the Dallas Development Code. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Berger, uh, Mr. Uh, Berger. Or Mr. Vandenberg, as I sometimes yeah, yeah. know. Uh, Bert Vandenberg, city, uh, assistant city attorney. Bear with me while I try to make this work. It should be sharing. Yes. Sharing, sharing. Yeah. Not sharing. Mr. Chair, uh, committee members, uh, we'll do a very brief discussion of uh, SB 929, um, talk about non-conforming uses and amortization hearings. Uh, the history of uh, non-conforming uses goes back to 19, maybe 29, when we put our first zoning code in place and we had our first non-conforming uses. So we've been doing this for a while. Yeah, that didn't work. Uh, so in 2023, uh, a state senator from Flower Mound Town, Kent Parker, uh, authored SB 929. It primarily changed how compensation was calculated, and it allowed, it specifically allowed owners and operators that were being amortized to recoup their value uh, in cash immediately, rather than having their uh, business amortized over time. Uh, Senator Parker didn't really make it a secret what he was doing um, or what it was aimed at. He 
and, and this is the bill analysis, the legislative bill analysis. It's available online at the Texas legislature's uh, website. Um, his first big complaint was that the way we did it, the way the city of Dallas did amortizations was that a business's value was done over time. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't pay cash out to the business for them to discontinue operations. They were allowed to recoup their investment over time so that let's say they had $50,000 remaining and I'll go into this later. And it would take them 5 years to recoup that investment. They had to close after 5 years. Um, and he, he felt that that was unfair. Um, this was aimed at the city of Dallas. It's, it's no secret that in, in Austin, a lot of bills come out that are aimed they're statewide. Some are aimed at specific cities. That's called bracketing. It's a city of 300,000 in two counties on the Gulf Coast, right? There's specific bills are aimed at specific cities. In this case, in the legislative write up, they talked about one city who put a number of auto related businesses out of work. That's the Hinga case. That was along Ross Avenue about 10 years ago. They were amortized out. Um, Mr. Hinga received a specific use permit, was allowed to operate longer. It's District 14. And eventually he was put out of business. Um, then, and, and the city ended up winning, winning that case. In one case, a uh, city threatened to drive a roofing materials factory that employs 150 workers. I think we know who he's talking about there too. Again, this is aimed at the city of Dallas. So here was the intention of the, of the legislature. They wanted to make it more difficult for cities to amortize uses. They wanted to, in, in some ways, they tried to make it impossible for the cities to do it by adding a poison pill. And the poison pill was the outlay of cash because cities don't budget to do that. We had always had a fair way, what we considered to be a fair way of amortizing uses that allowed it to go over time without an outlay of cash, from the, or an outlay of uh, compensation from the city. Unfortunately, uh, this was this is the bill that got passed, and we are now trying to comply with the bill, and we're trying to, in some ways, mitigate it. So that was the poison pill, and now I'll talk to you about the amortization process as it used to be. So a non-conforming use in the city of Dallas and almost everywhere is a use that was legal when it was established, but when the zoning changed or boundaries shifted, it became non-conforming. It was legal when it started, but because of changes in circumstances, it was no longer allowed where, where it was. Um, changes of zoning, addition of an SUP requirement. The SUP requirement is a pretty standard uh, way to make uh, businesses non-conforming. And amortization, as I explained earlier, it's setting a compliance period. Previously, was setting a compliance period that allows the owner to recoup their investment they made before the date of non-conformity. So the old process was this, the application was filed. Uh, they had the first board hearing was board of adjustment, the board of adjustment hearing where they, where they established if there was an adverse effect to surrounding properties. If an adverse effect was not established, the use was allowed to continue. However, if an adverse effect was established, they went to the second board hearing where they had uh, the, co the compliance hearing. And that was, to be honest, a, a battle of accountants where they did math to establish the, the amounts of what was the original investment, how long would it take to recoup that investment, and then the uh, use was allowed to continue until, until they had recouped their investment. Uh, generally, they appealed to district court, usually within 10 days. So this is the very simple old version of how they determine the amortization period. I'm not going to go through all the numbers, but again, at the end, it says that near the bottom, it's the net to be amortized. That's what's left over that this business in this example had not recouped. So they had $33,000 that they still had to recoup. The accountants figured it would take a $10,000 a year of recoupment. Therefore, the business would be allowed to operate for 3.3 years to recoup their investment. However, again, the poison pill, SB 929. I'm, I'm not gonna claim to be able to do this formula very quickly, but what's important to know about it is it made, they calculated a number and the business could close immediately, can now close immediately and just ask to be paid out the money that they would otherwise recoup over time. So SB, and I, and I, and I wanna, 
touch on this too, you know, in 2023, 2021, and 2019, the state legislature did a lot of bills aimed at cities and curbed a lot of our local control. Uh, 2023 was highlighted the first time we had a bill that was nicknamed the Death Star Bill, um, which was <clears throat> intended to preempt home rule cities from doing a lot of the uh, regulations that we do for our unique situations. Uh, that's currently being litigated. Uh, the trial court deemed it to be uh, unconstitutional on its face, and that's working its way through the courts now. However, uh, 929 went forward, and as previously pointed out, it was aimed at us uh, by Mr. by Senator Parker, and it revised how hearings are conducted. It required cities to calculate the, dimin ooh, the diminishment of market value due to the requirements. And then the third bullet is, again, the, the poison pill, Shutting down within 10 days of receiving the payment from the city for the amounts calculated. So, the results of SB 929 is that it puts the taxpayers at risk of having to uh, parlay a, a large amount of money that we will not know ahead of time uh, with no, no oversight from city council. It's not budgeted, it could just be expended. We don't know what the amounts will be. I know that land values are going up. I, I, I could not uh, speculate what the cost will be. I do know, though, that that money is already intended to go to other purposes, including public safety, street repairs, and, and other city priorities that we do through the budget process in September and October. Um, under what staff and has proposed, the city council will still be allowed to, to request a compliance hearing from the Board of Adjustment. And residents will still have the ability to go to city council meetings and sign up to speak and request their city council members to do so. That is what we have currently proposed. One last thing I'd like to talk about is what do other cities do? Dallas is unique. In Texas, and this is not an exhaustive list. This was the large cities and suburbs. Uh, I note that Flower Mound is not on it. I wish we had taken the time to look at what Flower Mound does. But only three cities allow residents to file amortization cases. Um, I suspect very strongly that if you check with Garland and Grand Prairie, is it Garland? Mesquite, Grand Prairie. Mesquite, Mesquite and Grand Prairie, sorry. Um, that they are currently going through the same process we, process we are. Um, and you'll note that a lot of cities don't even allow any amortization of non-conforming uses. That includes Austin, Fort Worth, El Paso. The other big cities don't really allow an amortization process. So we will still be allowing that at uh, city council initiated uh, with the ordinance we proposed. However, um, as noted, we would uh, allow only allow residents to petition or to go to the city council and speak before the city council at an at the open microphone period. Um, and finally, I guess we'll talk about next steps, and that's that. You know, this is only the first step of the journey. After this, it goes to city plan commission, and then we'll go to city council. And with that, I will stop sharing and ask if there's any questions. Thank you, Mr. Vandenberg. Uh, questions, Mark? Yes, I need a minute to pull up my. Uh, I left my notes at home in the rush of getting here. Uh, give me just a second. I guess one that uh, one that I can bring up that on top of my mind, Mr. Vandenberg. First of all, thank you for your presentation. That's very very helpful. Um, the, the 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 Texas bill makes mention not only of the owner but also of the lessee. Is that is that um, is the let's see in this case what you're referring to in your presentation is the operator? Yes. And are they entitled under the old rules to amortization? They were, weren't they? Yes. yes they are. Okay. Uh, second question is why um, why are we adding a fee? Let's see. Why are we taking away the the fee for the application of thousand dollars? It's crossed out in your um, document. I will defer to Mr. Burgess on that, but I think I know the answer. Uh, because the idea is that any any going forward would be council authorized, that therefore there would be no fee to an applicant. 
Anytime city council authorizes uh, any type of zoning action, it's the city's the applicant. There wouldn't be an individual coming in and requesting that application and paying that fee as such. Instead of um, instead of crossing it out and and leaving room for, uh, uh, not sure what misinterpretation. Could we just say NA not applicable? So that is actually an editing tool that that shows that later when it's published that will just be completely gone it won't be crossed out later that is that is right. how we edit the the documents okay that's just all right how we do all things right. <laughs> all right all right that works that works um if others have questions while i find my uh notes um, um no i i just wanted to make i just wanted to reiterate that you're saying that with the process that we're looking at today it will allow the residents the ability to interact and have a voice as to in front of their council as to what it is their wishes would like to be. Residents can always come to city council, sign up under the open microphone speaker rules and speak for three minutes is the standard rule uh, in front of city council on both briefing and agenda days. Um, I found my notes, right? Thank you. Um, th this is, uh, the original city ordinance was 19455. It's not, this is not it, is it? So 19455 was actually when we changed from, uh, chapter 51 to 51A, I think I could be wrong, but by 1986, mm -hmm. the entire code transferred. So everything that you currently see today kind of starts at 19455. Okay. But it's the same thing. It's this original document, just with a different. I'm number. sure there's been some tweaks, but I don't know what they are. It, 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 um, well, let me say this. It's mentioned in, in your report and in some of the notes. Um, I couldn't find it online. Uh, you can't always Google city ordinance. Da, 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 and I came up with a lot of other ordinances, but not that one. Could you uh, send us a link or a copy of it? Yeah, 19455, that is the Dallas Development Code. So if you're looking at Chapter 51A, that's. Oh, 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 I'm code. sorry. My bad. My bad. I'm looking at. Okay. Okay. My bad. I understand now. That's why I couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> right there. <laughs> You're right up. Uh, are all the changes that you propose here um, linked directly to um, the Texas change, or were there additional changes that you put in for any purpose? Uh, just, just some, you know, everything is either directly from the, the Senate bill, or they're just. Complimentary changes that clarify some things, um, and, uh, say the only thing that is maybe not directly related to the bill would be. As you guys had pointed out, uh, requiring a city council authorization. Okay. Um, and I guess the last one, and we'll hear from uh, members of the public later, but do you feel that the changes that we have here properly address the concerns that have been voiced before about uh, the public not having enough of a voice um, to protect themselves and the community from polluters? We believe that you can, that because the public can go to city council before city council and, and speak, they're still able to do so. The, the change is a result of what the legislature passed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'm done. I'm done. Uh, Mr. Berry, do you have any questions? Yes. Um, similar and following up on Enrique's um, question. Can you remind me in the state law, was there any language about removing the resident's ability to file for amortization or I, I you know, in the, the press, there was some stuff about, you know, that, that we are adding things. Can, can you maybe just explain that a little bit? Pat? Mr. Chair, the uh, committee member is correct. That was not explicitly put into the state law. Rather, our choice to do that, our recommendation to do that is a result of what we're calling the poison pill, the, the, the cash out alternative that we think that city council should be the ones to make that choice if there's the the risk of expenditure of public funds the again as i point out i think the last slide i had there were only three cities that we were aware of that even allowed residents to do so uh, now we're just going to be more in line with the rest of the state 
That's helpful. Thank you. Um, I'll ask a couple of questions. Um, I, thanks for the well, calculation or the example calculation on the amortization period. That was helpful. And I, I tracked that. I wanted to ask about a detail. Good. Towards the end of that calculation, your, your example shows a return on investment since inception, uh, which deducts 50,000 from the 83. Um, and so that the assumption there is that there's already been uh, value recaptured in the ongoing operation of the business that is that that is recognized in that calculation and therefore what is to be amortized is only 33 not 83. That is correct. And again, that's the battle of the accountants that occur that, that historically yeah. occurred. Well, whatever the, the numbers are, but yes. the principle. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the way it has been in the past. This example illustrates what we've had up until today. Correct. Okay. Moving forward, if the non-conforming business owner or lessee chose amortization, is it this calculation or is it something different? Defer to Casey. Yeah. So the, the dates are different now. So if you notice in the code amendment, there's two different parts there. There's a part about notice that gets sent out whenever there's a, a potential zoning change going to CPC. And then there's also, um, there's a second date in here that talks about whenever an application comes in and the notice gets sent out to that, to that property owner. So they can choose whichever one of those dates would give them the best deal. And then it's calculated based on whatever that diminution in value is and their cost of closing up based on that day. So it could be um, five years ago or it could be today, whatever would give them the better deal. Okay. Okay. So it, it might indeed work like this example or it might not. We don't know. So Correct. Yeah. And it would, it, it would depend on the individual application. Okay. So it's, there's a certain amount of, or there's uncertainty. Correct. More uncertainty than before. Uh, and it is entirely, just to be clear, is entirely the uh, non-conforming business or lessee, it's their choice whether it's amortization or an immediate payment. Correct. It is not the choice of Board of Adjustment. It is not the choice of City Council. It is entirely up to the non-conforming business. Correct. Okay. Okay. And so, hence, the recommendation from, from your office or the, the draft in front of us to um, allow city council to weigh in on this. Correct. Okay. All right. That's helpful. Um, if there's no other questions. I, 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 I would more please. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> I want to ask you uh, about an edit that you have in section three, which in your report is page four. Under 3A, you request to establish a compliance date. Let me know if you're there. I'm looking for it here. All right. Okay. So, section 3A, request to establish a compliance date uh, after this, the first sentence. Oh, I'll read the first sentence. The city council may request. That the Board of Adjustments consider establishing a compliance date for a non-conforming use. After that, you strike out, in addition, any person who resides or owns real property in the city may request that the Board consider establishing a compliance date for a non-conforming use. I know I'm missing something because you told me that uh, uh, people can uh, make a request to, to the Board. So why is this stricken out or where else is it? So currently our recommendation, what you have in front of you is remove that and only allow city council to make the application to make application with the board of adjustment. And residents could go to city council and speak in front of city council. There's a, a, an open microphone speaker period where they could request city council to, to consider it, but they, they would no longer be allowed to directly uh, make application. And how does that change? Um comply directly with the Texas um, changes? Again, the Texas law didn't address that specifically. Um, this Dallas, though, was one of the only cities, perhaps the only large city, that actually allowed residents to make application at the Board of Adjustment for compliance cases. And as a result of, of 
the changes to the Texas law, we are now saying that we believe that really only city council should be the ones to make that application because they can consider what the financial impact of the city will be. Okay. Okay, thanks again. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Hedberg. Um, Ms. May, do you think we could go to speakers? Sure, now? absolutely. And so you will call the speakers and I believe uh, Vice Chair Blair is gonna keep time. It, at two minutes. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll start with the registered speakers. We have 13 and then if there's others present today that's not registered, you will certainly allow you to speak. So, okay. I think that, uh, if, if you're okay with this, I'll name the first five and so they can start to know that they're on deck and coming up. Um, and then we'll just kind of progress as we go through the list. Um, so, first up, we have Evelyn Mayo, then Edward Brookins. And then Jen Schoenberg, uh, Schoenbeck, and uh, Cindy Hua, which I think is online, and Alicia Kendrick, which I believe is, are also online. So I'll move them to panelists. Right. And, okay. Yes, and if you'll come to this podium, podium yeah. and there should be a microphone button to turn it on. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, uh, good morning. My name is Evelyn Mayo. I'm speaking in opposition to this change. We understand that there are elements required by the state, such as the compensation calculated and the cash versus time. However, limiting the residential rights is not included in this state law. The city attorney is conflating the time and money question. It's either or. Okay, so there's a big assumption being made that every company will select this money option, but that is a large assumption. Um, think about the Hinga example versus the GAF example. These are very different in terms of assessing whether the company will opt for time or money, right? And so, you know, we've had the independent uh, assessment done for the GAF facility, for example, and their calculation accounting for SB 929 is three to four years or 36 to 45 million dollars. The chances of GAF leaving, opting for the money in exchange for that, you know, three to four years is slim to none. So there's a big assumption being made about this time versus money question. Removing this rights from residents is the last line of defense that communities like West Dallas have. Um, and offering up an open mic to lobby council is just really pathetic. And I think we can all know that. Um, residents can still apply and there can be council oversight. It is not an either or, it's not a mutually exclusive scenario. So we really implore you to think long-term about the implications of this change. This is one of the most progressive um, aspects of Dallas's code and it has been the last line of defense for so many communities um, to date. And so removing that right is a huge disservice um, to this generation, but also future generations to come. So please think about the time versus money piece and the fact that it's not mutually exclusive to have council that's, oversight and resident. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Next we have Edward Brooken. Uh, good morning, members of the committee. My name is Edward Brookins, and I serve as an attorney at Advocates for Community Transformation, or ACT. We are a nonprofit organization that works to make neighborhood safety reality for everyone in our city. Throughout the city of Dallas, there are neighbors who experience fear in their homes, their schools, and their places of worship because of violence and crime that spills out from a building next door or across the street. ACT mobilizes and equips neighborhoods to leverage civil laws against nuisance properties taking legal action against property owners who allow crime to run rampant in the community. In the neighborhoods where we work, properties operating under a non-conforming use can sometimes be havens for crime. Amortization is a tool that our clients can use to put a stop to this activity. It is a tool that can create tremendous change for communities. And we ask that as you consider this amendment, which would eliminate residents' ability to utilize this process, that you also could take into account how that would impact their ability to protect their neighborhoods. In shutting down a nuisance property, we have seen how residents who were once daily burdened with fear 
are now experiencing the freedom of peace and safety. While we've had success in filing nuisance lawsuits in district court, this strategy does not allow us to challenge the use of a property, which can be the primary source of the problem. And though council members will still be able to bring amortization cases under the proposed ordinance, this amendment will take away the opportunity for residents to have their voices heard when confronting non-conforming non-conforming nuisance properties. The case that is put on by the city is different than the case that is put on by from a resident's perspective. So we ask that you that you help us to continue the work of promoting public safety in our city by maintaining residents' rights to fight for the well-being of their neighborhoods. I thank you for your time this morning. Hey, next we have uh, Jim Schermbeck, and um, I I wanted to apologize and just say um, I do have the addresses of the uh, first two speakers, but if you would, when you begin, start with your name and then state your address. Yeah, my address too, do you not? I do, but if you wouldn't mind setting an example. Only if you don't take it out of my two minutes. <laughs> I don't. Is that a deal? I don't take it out for two minutes. Okay, thank you. Some people do, some people don't. Jim Schoenbeck, down Wonders at Risk, 1808 South Good Latimer Expressway, Dallas, Texas, 75226. Anybody who seriously suggests to solve City of Dallas problems by approaching the five minute general speaking time at every City Council meeting has never tried to get anything from the Dallas City Council meeting before. That is obvious, but it is not a serious proposal. Last time we were here, it was just environmental groups and residents who were opposed to this. Now it's those groups and residents, the Dallas Morning News, the right wing think tanks who thought up this law, the state senator who sponsored the bill, and the city council for the most part itself that says this is not acceptable. This goes beyond what the state law demands, and they are correct. There are at least two parts of this law, and the city attorney is conflating those two parts. One is the auditing process, which we desperately need in, here in this example, particularly with GAF. The other is the accounting process and the way of the decision process, what to do with that information. We desperately need the auditing and investigative tool. What if the city council has a conflict of interest with the amortized facility? What if they've been paid contributions? What if they are not, as the person before me just suggested, doesn't have the resident's case or a greater interest in mind? Only the residents can speak for themselves. The fact that we are one of three cities in Dallas should not mitigate that right. That is not a reason to get rid of that right. That is a reason to protect that right. We are proud of this right. We want this right to remain, and it does not interfere with the execution of the state law at all. It allows the investigation to go forward. And I can assure you, when it comes to JF, there's a lot of dispute about how much it would really take to get rid of these guys. Is it 30 million or 100? Let's find out. Let the city weigh the evidence first, as presented by the residents, not by any third party. That's your time. Please don't roll back these rights. Don't side with the city attorney and GAF. Um, next up, we have uh, Ms. Hua, but um, she's online, and we're trying to make sure her camera is working. Um, and we will continue to work on that. Um, we also did have uh, Alicia Kendrick online, but I don't see her. So, oh, you're right there. Great. Um, would you mind coming to the podium, please? Mm -hmm. Um, next up, uh, just to keep everybody um, on on deck, uh, we have Gerardo Figueroa, um, Jaylene, um, Catherine Rosas, uh, Tony Carrillo, and Jennifer Rangel. Make sure they're in the audience. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alicia Kendrick. My address is forty seven forty one Joppa Circle. And honestly, I probably won't even need the full two minutes. It's simple to me as complicated as the city has made this issue and as drawn out as the city has made this issue. It is really a, a question to yourself. Do I believe the residents of West Dallas, their children, their pets deserve to breathe polluted air? Am I willing to stand with a company that could leave under a report that says they could leave in that time, shorter time? 
Do I believe that they should breathe this right? And am I willing to say that I stand with money and a company rather than the residents of Dallas? Am I comfortable with that? Will I go home and look at my child and say, wow, you look just like this other baby in West Dallas who has COPD or is developing COPD and will continue to develop COPD in the timeline that it would take GAF to leave under their standards. It is really that simple and shame on anyone that believes it is complicated. You have families, you have children. Nobody should have to come and again pity and push their humanness on you. Thank you. All right, next up we have Gerardo Figueroa and then Jaylene. Um, Catherine Rosas is online. Um, and then Tony Carilla. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Gerardo Figueroa, 2220 West Clarendon Drive, Dallas, Texas. I'm here today supporting the West Dallas residents in their struggle to remove GAF. We all don't have uh, the privilege to attend city council meetings. It's not as easy as a city attorney says, but it is important. Today is important. Everyone here today knows the difference between right and wrong. You people from Zoac know the difference between right and wrong. The GAF lawyers know the difference between right and wrong. We all know what the right thing to do here. The people of West Dallas should not have to live next to an industrial polluter, to live, breathe, and die with this. It is not right. I personally would not want my children, my family, my friends to have to deal with this on a daily basis. None of us here would. The city has failed West Dallas. These residents have the right to remove these hazardous businesses from their neighborhoods, to not be bullied by big corporations. Please allow these residents to once and for all remove this polluter. I ask you to do the right thing. Gaf, vete ya. Uh, next we have Jaylene and not get a lap anymore in address. Good morning, my name is Jalen Salvador. Um, my address is 5005 High Ridge Drive. Um, I'm here on behalf of my organization called Mi Familia Vota. I'm here because the right to protect our communities from hazardous businesses is a non-negotiable. Amortization is a tool and assertion that even when the city falters, citizens can have the right to refuse to be powerless against the encroachment of hazardous businesses. <laughs> The very essence of amortization is the people's recourse against the specters of crime ridden enterprises and perilous factories affecting our health. The city's own egregious failure in addressing the GAF complaint is a stark warning that they can and are bound to repeat this negligence in other neighborhoods. We refuse to continue being victims of such neglect. We demand the unassailable right to take matters into our own hands. As such, the new state law crucially must not overlook our right to file and any attempt by the city to infringe upon our fundamental rights is an intolerable affront to the well-being of each and every constituent. Uh, next speaker is uh, Catherine Rosa. Okay. Uh, she was, but I'm not seeing her anymore. Um, Okay, I'm going to read out the next couple of names um, and we'll pick her up whenever I can see her back online. Um, Tony Carrillo, Jennifer Rangel, Angel Garcia Don Juan, uh, Jose Rodriguez, and Janie Cisneros are the uh, remainder of our find up speakers. Is there, uh, is Tony here? Okay. Um, Jennifer Rangel? She's got mine too. Oh, there she is. Uh, let me see if I can make her a panelist and let's see if I can uh, go to is a, uh, Angel Garcia Don Juan here. Online. Online. Uh, Jose Rodriguez. Present. Not present. Um, Janie Cisneros. Okay. Would you like to come to the podium while I get these other folks as panelists online?
Jen and Chris, they did it there, but they're not able to be panelists. I don't know. They said they can't let me into our chat. Um, I think I just got, um, okay, I'm working on it. Was it then? Jennifer Rangel is a panelist, but she needs to have her camera and microphone on when she's she's ready. Uh, let's see. Okay. And should we allow Ms. Cisneros? Yes. Ms. Cisneros, go ahead. Okay. My name is Janie Cisneros. I live at 2821 Bedford Street, Dallas, Texas. 75212. You have power and you are voting on something that will affect the powerless. I'm sure within the walls of City Hall, there's chatter of Dallas striving to be a world class city, but this is not what a world class city does. This is not how a world class city treats its people. Accepting this amendment entrenches Dallas to be a city that will always be divided by class. Accepting this amendment is a signal that the racial equity plan is a farce, that the plans, commissions, and programs that have environmental justice as a tenant is a farce. It is straight up ugly that we are here to defend a right. This shows that the city of Dallas still has strong, strong connections to its dark historic past. Stop protecting the worst of Dallas's past. We, the residents of the city, are stakeholders. Don't take mechanisms away from taxpaying people that can help shape our city. The current city code states that non-conforming uses be eliminated. In fact, past city attorneys use that very line to win amortization cases in front of the Board of Adjustment. If the city had abided by its code in the first place and made concerted efforts to remove non-conforming uses that are causing serious harm to neighborhoods, residents would not have a need to use this tool. If the city had been proactive and taken measures to actually protect its people from dangerous industrial uses, poisoning our air, I would not have a need to file for amortization. My experience shows lobbying to my councilman does not work in favor of the residents. Some want to focus on the audacity of my amortization request instead of focusing on how the city has treated the people of West Dallas for generations. We've had enough. You have power, do what is right. Take the action that shows Dallas is ready to unchain itself from its dark past. Okay, next we have uh, Cindy Hua, and if you wouldn't mind, make sure you, uh, you give me your, your address. Yes, um, I think I've got everybody's address so far, but if you put it on the, for the speakers that have not signed up. All right. Good morning, everyone. Cindy Hua, address 718 Crusty Cove Drive, Garland 75040. I'm here representing Downwinders at Risk, a clean air and environmental justice nonprofit based in Dallas. My thoughts and position on this proposed code change have not changed from the month prior. I'm here to express my opposition to the proposed code change under consideration regarding the amortization or scheduled closure of nonconforming uses. It's crucial that we preserve the residents' right to file for amortization and that the city of Dallas also makes a motion to preserve it and not remove it. Amortization has proven to be a valuable tool used by residents to remove establishments that pose a threat to our communities. Liquor stores, high crime businesses, dangerous factories like lead smelters have all been rightfully targeted through this mechanism. It empowers the people to safeguard our homes, our families, and the well-being of our neighborhoods. However, the proposed amendment raises questions about whether it will let neighborhoods down when they are in need. This is why we must have the right to take matters into our own hands when it comes to safeguarding our communities. The new state law does not mention anything about removing the residents' right to stop. Um, we have, um, Ms. Rosas and, uh, Ms. Rangel online, um, but we need to see, um, their camera on in order to take their, uh, speakers. So there we go. Um, that the, uh, Catherine Rosas, please say your name and address and, and start talking. Good morning. I'm Catherine Rosas, address 524 South Brain Avenue, Dallas, Texas, 75208. 
Um, I'm speaking in opposition to this proposition. I'm here in solidarity with West Dallas residents and Singleton United because residents have the right to protect their neighborhoods by removing hazardous and dangerous businesses that could affect the rest of their lives, like what has happened to me. Today, because of growing, next, growing up next to large scale polluters, I have chronic illnesses I will need to treat for the rest of my life. My illnesses impact every element of my life from schooling, employment, general safety, um, taking months off for hospitalizations and recovery regularly. I wish the city was considerate and proactive in knowing that people should not live near polluters, but that wasn't the, my case and it hasn't been the case for many other people. If the city is not going to be proactive in seeking the best health outcomes for their residents, the residents at least need the independence and opportunity to raise awareness to the city and file for amortization. Residents have the right to protect their neighborhoods by removing dangerous businesses. You have the opportunity to be a leader in our state in protecting and prioritizing residents. If you care about residents' employment, health care, general safety, you need to care about their independence in raising environmental and health concerns. It is all undeniably connected. Please don't roll back this essential tool for us residents. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, we have uh, Ms. Uh, Rangel. Can you all see me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, good morning. My name is Jennifer Rangel. Address is 1441 West Mount Avenue, apartment 224, Dallas, Texas, 75211. And I serve as Rio Planning's Executive Director. Rio Planning is an urban planning nonprofit that fights for environmental, housing, and economic justice. And I just have a few questions for the ZOAC members this morning. How do you all reconcile all the money that for decades has been spent and of which continues to be spent in medical bills or other related expenses by Dallas residents because of inappropriate land uses in close proximity to where they live? How does this code amendment promote the public health, safety, and general welfare for all? How will you address the overwhelmingly disproportionate pollution burden by black, indigenous, and people of color communities in the city of Dallas. If their voice is muted and the pathway for self-determination is blocked, when the request is ignored during the open mic request. And if this amendment is passed, what will you say to Singleton United residents who have been advocating for months for what we all deserve, clean air, enjoyment of their home and neighbors who add to their quality of life, not diminish it. Bottom line, as you've heard from advocates this morning, the new state law says nothing about the resident's right to file for amortization. The city should not dilute a resident's right to file for it. Listen to the voice of the community. We're daily living with the lack of environmental and housing justice because of the city's policies and practices. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, we have Angel Garcia. I can see him online. Can I mute? Start with your name and your address. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, my name is Angel Garcia Don Juan um, at 2011 Denison Street, Dallas, Texas, 75212. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of West Dallas, and I'm in opposition of any measure that seeks to remove the right of residents to file for amortization. Amortization is a recognition of the fact that people on the ground who face injustice know what is best for them and are more than competent enough to make those determinations. Any attempt at limiting this right sends a clear message. Elected officials do not believe that residents are knowledgeable or confident enough to decide what is, what is best for them. Additionally, this would disproportionately impact BIPOC communities, seeing that these have become opposed to the most harmful non-conforming uses. The proposal to limit the right to file for amortization clearly seeks to ensure that more people remain in the shadows. Large corporations should not be protected at the expense of communities of color. In recognition of this, you should be working to preserve the rights of residents and support our fight against environmental racism. Thank you. Okay, um, from our signed up, uh, our speakers that signed up online, we still have Tony Carrillo and Jose Rodriguez are either here. Okay, great. Um, well, then from there, I think we can start um, just the people that showed up that would like to speak. Um, so we have some yellow cards on the podium. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, if you, you're okay with just yes. people lining it, y'all can line up or y'all can come sit at the front row while someone else is talking and, um, please begin. Uh, I will also note that, uh, 
Cindy Watt, uh, was sort of cut off and she had a little time remaining. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Cindy, are you, I see that you're still a panelist, but I don't see your face. Um, would you like to continue or complete? Yes, that would be wonderful actually. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you, but we can't see you. I think she had about 50 seconds, if that's how I recall. About halfway through your call. Yeah, about halfway. Are you able there we, there we are. Are you able to see me now? Okay. Perfect. Um so so is that the, the fact that amortization has proven to be a valuable tool used by residents across the U.S. to remove establishments um, that pose a threat to our communities? Liquor store, high crime businesses, and dangerous factories like lead smelters have all been rightfully targeted through this mechanism, and it empowers people to safeguard our homes, families, and the well-being of our neighborhoods. Um, however, this proposed amendment raises questions about whether they'll let neighborhoods down when we're in need. Um, and this is why we must have the right to take matters into our own hands when it comes to safeguarding our communities. The new state law doesn't say anything about removing residents' right to file for amortization. The right to raise our voices and take action when necessary is a democratic value that should not be taken away. The city should uphold and protect our civil rights, not take them away. Amortization has proven to be a powerful tool in protecting neighborhood self-determination, and we must ensure that it remains accessible to those who need it. Let residents make the case to the city in an open and transparent form through amortization. Let us maintain a system of accountability in our city and protect our rights to have decision-making. I'm sorry, Ms. Bob, that, that's, that's the limit of your time. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone in the audience like to speak? Good morning, everyone. My name is Sandra Avalos. I am a community organizer and I also work with um, and some upper bound students that are actually attend um, Kingston High School. When our students found out um, about this situation, they became infuriated because this is the community they live in. This is how frustrating that they that they can't even be here because they have to be in class. And so I'm here to speak for them and to share that um, that our students are seeing this, they're paying attention, and they're pretty soon are going to be voters, and they're going to be aware of where you all are standing, and also where these companies are standing. Um, again, Sandra Valos, thirteen twenty two Mentor Avenue, Dallas, Texas, and five two one six. Thank you. No, are, there, are there any other speakers this morning? All right. Uh, well, thank you for uh, your time. Uh, I'm going to go back to uh, the committee to see if there's any further questions. Mm -hmm. any, any questions to our speakers? Uh, any questions for staff? Okay. I think strange, but. <laughs> Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Barron. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, um, perhaps I'm a bit confused, but I, I want to follow up on um, a point that Chair Housewright made earlier, and he asked if the decision to do amortization or not is up to the the lessee or the owner. And not up to council or anyone else. Then what what is the benefit to the change that's being proposed as far as who can request amortization if if ultimately it's the decision of the the lessee if, if that makes sense I appreciate clarification, Mr. Chair. Uh, in in response to the committee members' question, once the the Board hearings are complete. A number will be presented that will give both a number and a time. And in the, in the old example I gave, it was $33,000 and it gave 3.3 years. At that moment, the owner or operator will have the choice between picking the money and leaving now versus uh, amortizing over time and remaining in place. That is 
because we don't know if they will choose time or money. We've heard the different uh, beliefs of what of what they'll choose. That that's why we think that council should be the ones to file the cases, so that we will be prepared to uh, pay from the from the public fisc if we if we need to. Um, on that vein, when you're saying that uh, time versus money, do you have a, a, a guess or a, have you seen, is it easy for a large corporation that once it's decided that they're non-conforming and they must be amortized that they can just get up and leave in 10 days, or does it take them years to wind down and remove themselves from an area? I don't actually have personal experience in that. I'm, I'm not, I could hazard a guess and say that it is that when they say they're going to stop in 10 days, it's probably difficult to do so. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Casey. No, I don't have anything further. So if, if, we are saying that it's large corporations are not able to um, stop in a dime and, and leave, then we would probably, it would it be a fair guess to say that we would probably see them leave over a period of time, whether it, you know, based on the amortization rules that, that is given to them? Our timeline that's given to them. I, I I would not want to hazard a guess on that. I, I really don't know how the operations. I don't know if they could just cease operations or if they would wind down as as you said. So let me ask another question. So what if we do have a a company that has been deemed non-conforming? They are they they've gone to the all they exhausted all of their um, processes within the city, and they don't leave and you know so they they just don't do anything would that be then up to our code compliance organizations to make sure that they follow the code process to um shut them down yes okay, thank you um i have a follow-up i'm sorry yeah uh, please go ahead Barry. Thank you. Um, how is the timeline determined and does the resident have the opportunity to speak into that uh, with council or who makes that decision? And that's so the, uh, Mr. Chair, in response, the timeline, once an adverse effect is found, the timeline historically, I, I showed you how it was done historically. I kind of understand how the old timeline was done. It would still be similar once the amount of the recoupment of the investment is done in addition to the difference in the market value. I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know all the calculations. The money over time is determined by how quickly they can recoup their investment or recoup that amount. And then it's done over time. It's done by accountants, not by, by lawyers. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's the residents really don't get the opportunity to speak to that really. No one does. I'm there. It is a, usually a public hearing. Nonetheless, it generally comes down to accountants making those decisions um, or making those observations and then the board of adjustment making that determination. So, so it's, it's, stri it's strictly a financial exer uh, exercise and not uh, any other factors considered. Cor correct. Mm -hmm. It is strictly financial. Okay, thank you. So, I think that's an interesting point that. Well, and under the current ordinance, a citizen may initiate this process, but as to the outcome, as to the length of amortization, et cetera, that is entirely unknown and is not uh, under the control of the citizen that initiated the, the process. That is true. Right. Under the current law, the resident would make the, they would, they would make the case to create to show the adverse effect. Mm -hmm. But once an adverse effect is shown and they go to the second hearing, then it becomes a battle of accountants and the board of adjustment makes that determination. Okay. So um, what I think we've learned uh, this morning is that the new state law does not necessarily um, require us 
to eliminate citizen input. But, but that the draft ordinance that uh, we've been looking at and that the public is responding to is a recommendation to uh, largely protect the uh, financial interest of the city uh, in the event of a large uh, payment of damages to uh, a nonconforming business. And that, and that, that those payments to that business would uh, diminish the amount of funds available for things like public safety or a new park or a new library, et cetera. So, so I mean, I, I certainly understand the, the, the intention there. A question I would have is, is there a way to have both? Is there, it, it, from the city attorney's perspective, is there language that could be added or amended into this draft ordinance that that does allow for citizen input, but also protects the financial interest of the city. You think, given time, that that might that there there might be a way to uh, draft something like that. So I will answer by saying again, we, we believe that being able to go to the city council meetings and speak, even though I've heard some difference of opinions on that today. We believe that, that allows that opportunity. That being said, if it is the will of the body, we will we will look into that. We will see what we can do. So it's not would not be impossible to uh, craft language along those lines. I don't believe it would be impossible. I, I think it would be a challenge, and we are always up for a challenge. <laughs> I know you are. I know you are. We appreciate it. Um, I'll ask my committee members if they have any more questions, any more comments. I do. Okay. Um, going on that same vein, let me ask a very pointed question. And, and if I'm out of line off basis, please let me know. Um, but hearing the residents and knowing what is in front of us, um, To draft the language to 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 change the language to add, to add what 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 chair was was talking about the the to allow um, residential um, input would that be something that can all well until it until the ordinance is 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 made an ordinance is something that is that is open for discussion at any period of the process. Certainly uh, at ZOAC, at the City Planning Commission and at City Council, that is a topic that we could talk that about. The commissioners or the council members can discuss. Thank you. So put a finer point on this. We have this hearing today, we have likely multiple hearings at Planning Commission mm -hmm. followed by a hearing or more at City Council. And possibly right. even a committee meeting in between that council. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Berry, you have a question? Uh, yes, quick follow up, if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, is there a scenario in which, regarding the timeline, I, I was hearing two concerns obviously, the amortization, but also, I think, the, um, as we just touched on, the, Kind of the fact that the timeline is locked in. Uh, is there a scenario in which that could be changed where instead of strictly a financial exercise, maybe the council member has some some voice in that and the, and the residents could advocate for other factors to influence the timeline? Uh, not under the state law. Okay. You have, you have a follow up, Mr. Berry? No, thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, again, we're, we are constrained in, in large part by, um. State law, but I, I think. I'm hearing, um. Some, some interest in. Further exploration of, of language that could preserve the citizen right to. Uh, initiate a process like this and so, um. I'm willing to entertain more questions and comments. I'm also willing to entertain a motion if we had a motion. 
Wait, I think we're ready for a motion. I have a motion. Well, uh, last year. And after my motion, if I have a second, I have comments. Okay. Thank you. I move to send the item as written to the city plan commission, but require staff to consider the addition of an application process for residents to ask city council to authorize a request to the board. The process should prevent applicants having a financial interest and not intrude in the board of adjustment process. I'll second the motion. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion by Commissioner Blair. We have a second by Committee Member McGregor. Uh, comments? I understand the resident's request. Believe it or not, I too live in a community that has some of the same concerns. This motion to move it to CPC does not preclude the opportunity for changes to be written into what we see right now. Trust me, I hear you. I know you because I am you. And in saying that, if you know what I have done at CPC, you know that I hear you and I see you because I am you. So please don't take what we've done today and say that we have negatively impacted you because we have not. We have just said that there is more that needs to happen that this body can do. And in knowing that is more that needs to happen than that this body can do, give us the opportunity to take it to the next body that can possibly, that will probably and possibly do more. Thank you. Well said, Commissioner. Um, uh, to that, I would add that, uh, this is a no brainer for me. Uh, I'm really appreciative of the community uh, coming up, speaking up, uh, actually informing us in many different uh, perspectives and aspects of this issue. Um, I absolutely don't see the need to remove the right of, uh, of petitioning to the Board of Adjustments from residents. Uh, it's not indicated anywhere in SB 929. So on this issue, I'm 100% with the community and and I will support the motion. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. Um, I'll just say that uh, I can't improve on Commissioner Blair's comments. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I agree with that. We we do uh, we do hear you, and we take this issue seriously. I appreciate everyone coming down and speaking to us, uh, taking time out of your morning. It's, this is an important issue, and we, we understand it's important to you. It's important to us. It's important to the entire city. And in in that respect, I want to thank the the city attorney's office for being willing to work with us to uh, just get some, some improvement in, in the language um, over the next weeks. Um, I think that uh, we'll be able to get there. And I know this this committee, as well as the plan commission on which I sit, will will work hard to get this right for you. Um, so we appreciate your your patience with, uh, with the process. Um, are there any other comments before we take a vote? I hope uh, that among the people that spoke today and, and spoke so well, I think we're seeing some potential future leaders of our city. That has nothing to do with the motion, but I well, <laughs> you said any comment. All right, well, we have a motion on the table uh, at, that was read into the record a moment ago. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The, the motion passes unanimously with the uh, four. Uh, He's in opposition. I thought, did you raise your hand in, in favor or in opposition, Mr. Bering? Uh, in favor. Oh, okay. thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, so it is it is unanimous of four. Um, we have a couple of more pieces of left. business this morning. If I'm not mistaken, I think there's a, it's sort of some, some calendar issues, some housekeeping. Uh, this, that concludes our formal business, but we're going to, we've got a couple more minutes of business for our committee. Um. So I sent out a draft 2024 ZOAC calendar earlier, and it follows the CPC calendar that was approved on uh, November 2nd um, as the Tuesday before the CPC meeting. Um, is there any, y'all need any changes to that? No. We're good. We're good. Great. Yeah. Oh. Uh, um, we need a, do we need a motion and a vote or are we just? 
Yes, and uh, but we could also make, do we want to talk about December as well? Yeah, it, as part of that. Okay, yeah. great. Um, and also, we have a lot of things going on at the city on December 5th, which is our next scheduled ZOAC meeting. Um, we have um, PD staff is presenting to the quality of life committee um, at the same time as our ZOAC meeting is normally scheduled. So, we were going to request to see if we can move the meeting from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. of the same day. Objection. I'm, I'm good with that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we want a motion and a second to approve the calendar items as presented. I'll excited. Uh, uh, committee member McGregor. I second. Second by Commissioner Blair. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Is that it? Great. Okay. And then do you want to call the time that we adjourned? Um, it is 1022. Um, our meeting now stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.